Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live from the News Hub. I am Paul Shigabo. Coming up this afternoon. Families of three Takwade kidnapped girls request past presidents and diplomatic missions to intervene in the search of their girls. And also coming up, main opposition NDC Congress parliamentary primary set to get heated in the coming days. And in international news, DR Congo confirms first case of Ebola in the eastern city of Goma. Details coming up shortly. And in our very first story, an Accra High Court presided over by Justice Mele Wood has rescinded its decision to grant bail to Gregory Afoko. Gregory Afoko had been held in police custody for 120 days after being granted bail earlier by another High Court judge, Justice George Boydi, on March 14 this year. Gregory Afoko is being tried over the murder of NPP Regional Party Chairman Adams Mahama in 2015. The chief state attorney, Marina Apia Opari, said in a court that Mr. Afoko will not make himself available for the trial if he was released. Counsel for Afoko challenged the submission of the chief state attorney. The judge, however, ruled in favor of the chief state attorney and explained that the verdict was based on the facts available before her. Let's now follow up on this developing story and families of the three Takwade kidnapped girls are calling on past presidents, civil society groups as well as their diplomatic mission to intervene in the search of the girls. The family says the silence on the whereabouts of their girls from security agencies is weighing them down. Michael Labukranchi, an elder brother of one of the kidnapped girls, spoke on behalf of the families. What is most shocking is how the Ghana Police Service and National Security Operatives were able to gather all arsenals to rescue the two missing Canadian nationals with the speed of light three weeks after they were reported missing. So we ask, why can't the same security agencies in the country use that same bold speed to bring back our girls? The first suspect, Samuel Wills stated earlier in his statement that the second suspect, John Oji, knows the whereabouts of our girls and that should he, Oji, be found, he could show where the girls are. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, it has been over a month since the arrest of the second suspect, yet no information has come out from the suspect nor the police. As we hold this press conference, the families of the three missing girls are desperate for news about our daughters and their whereabouts. This is giving us sleepless nights with its attendant health implications. It's been about 12 months since the first victim, Prisla Bintum, was kidnapped in August 2018 before the two others, Ruth Love Quaisin, and Presla Mantibia Crunchy followed respectively in December of the same year. Matters relating to the rescue of the three girls have sparked so much controversies and aroused, aroused very deep sympathy and sentiment amongst Ghanaians, yet no major headways has been made so far as information available to affected families is concerned. From the aforementioned, the affected families would want to state the following. One, the Ghana Police Service and government officials should stop raising our hopes and later come to dash them as have been the case all this while. They should also stop the false reportage to you, the media, about the case. Two, we want the authorities to investigate who aided Samuel Wills the first suspect to escape from the Takrade Central Police Station, as he stated he was aided by a police officer. Hence, mm. 
let's delve further into this development as Michael Labu Crunchy is here with me in the studio. Thanks so much for joining us, Michael. So, Michael, first of all, what has been the engagement of the families of the three kidnapped girls and the Ghana Police Service since the last press conference by COP Mamiya Tiwadu Dankwa? Very well. Good afternoon to you and your viewers. Um, since the last pre press conference by COP Tiwadu Dankwa, we, the family, have tried all possible means to get in touch with the police. But it seems they give us limited information. Anytime, what have they been telling you? Anytime you go to them, they tell you they are working and that we should exercise patience. That is all that they, they tell us mm -hmm. when we go there. Now, in your press conference, you're saying the police is also giving you false hope. What do you mean by false hope? Very well. We, were, we, we seem to be recovered from the shock. When Mame Yatiwa came out to say she knows the whereabouts of the girls. And we were very happy. In fact, it made us happy that even some relatives were planning to have a party when she comes back. That is in relation to my sister Priscilla Crunchy. And it all turned out to be false. Not knowing she she herself came up, came back to admit that um, it was a way of comforting the families, which I think is in the right way. So what informed your decision to hold the press conference today? Very well. Um, since we are not getting much information from the police, we think the press conference will, will enable them to um, give out information. We've been going to them, as I said earlier on, anytime you try reaching out to them, they only tell you we are working around the clock, everything is, is under control and stuff. That seems not enough. Mm -hmm. We want more. They should tell us what have the suspects told them about the whereabouts of the girls. We want such information. Now you're calling on past presidents, members of the diplomatic corps, the di diplomatic mission, as well as civil society groups to intervene. What exactly do you want these personalities to do? We know when they speak, the security agencies and those in authorities do listen. So our humble appeal to them is that they should, they should try talking to those in charge, that is the CID, the BNI, and the national security. They should try engaging them, possibly to find out what they are doing, what exactly they are doing, where exactly they've got into with their investigations. What's been the impact of this case on your family? It's disheartening. It's disheartening. Very well, in the case of my sister, in fact, our mom passed how, um, she died about six to seven years ago, and that she's the only girl that we have in our midst. And unfortunately, we, we can't find where she is now. So it, it's somewhat devastating, if I should say. After this, what next? After this press conference? Very well. I don't think um, we might take further action because I do believe this press conference is going to lead to better results. So I'm just hoping and looking forward to that. If not the case, if not the case, we are going to make series of press releases to the national, the first lady, uh, Madame Rebecca Kufuado, to mm. the second lady, Madame Samira Baumia, um, to the women, various women advocates, mm. the FIDA Ghana. We are we are going to appeal to them if nothing comes out of the press conference. Have you received any support from social welfare, be it psychological? Or emotional support? Well, we were supposed to receive some support from them, but um, it came for a while, say about a month, they brought a psychologist, he engaged my dad mm -hmm. for a while and now no one seems to, to care, if I should say, for the want of a better word, no one seems to care. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time. You're and welcome. Michael Labi Crunchy is brother of one of the kidnapped girls. Well, TV3 will um, be on this matter and give you updates in our subsequent bulletins. You're still watching Media Live from the News Hub. Let's do some political news. And the National Democratic Congress NDC parliamentary primaries is set to get heated in the coming days. A number of aspirants have already picked forms to represent the party ahead of the 2020 general elections. Well, Kwachi Afre Nyama has the wrap-up and the following political desk reports. 
The leadership of the NDC has set August 24 for its parliamentary primaries in most constituencies across the country. The party has, however, put the process on hold in some selected constituencies, including Hohoi and Tano South. This year's contest is very crucial for the electoral fortunes of the NDC, having lost a number of seats in the 2016 general elections. Fresh faces, including actor John Dumelo and former information minister Felix Kwachi and retired senior police officer Peter Tobu have picked forms to contest. Also, old faces including Nadoli Kalio MP, Alban Bagbin and Ketu South MP Fifi Kwete will not be seeking re-election. There are a number of constituencies where the race is expected to be hotly contested. One of them is the Ningo Pram Pram constituency where the incumbent and first-time MP Sam George is facing stiff competition from his own constituency chairman Michael Tete Kwete. In the Clotekole constituency, current MP Dr. Zanotta Rollins will face competition from former constituency chairman Ni Alemna Bashiru and Lee Ford Kwashi. The Adentam constituency is one other area to watch as former gender minister Nanao Yelita and 2016 candidate Mohamed Adamu Ramadan are set to battle it out for the ultimate prize. Also in the contest is former MCE for Adentan Benjamin Angbenu. Actor John Dumelo is coming up against Susie Afua Adobo in the Ayawaso West Wagon constituency. At the close of nominations on Friday, July 12, surprisingly, the three-time candidate Delali Kwesi Brimpon had not filed to contest. In the Upper West region, former Health Minister and veteran parliamentarian Joseph Yilechre will have to convince delegates to elect him as candidate for another term but he will face strong competition from retired police superintendent and former executive secretary to the inspector general of police Peter Tobu. Peter Tobu's decision to contest has already become a subject of debate but that is not surprising as it is rare to find police officers moving into politics. At the controversial Talency constituency, incumbent MP P.T. Baba faces just one opponent, Takuzi Nicholas. With the MPP determined to reclaim the Talency seat, delegates will have to make a choice of retaining the current MP or going for a fresh face. Incumbent members of parliament like Brusa South MP Dr. Clementa Park, a majority leader, and Tamale South MP Harina Idrisu have little to worry about as they will be running unopposed. And some big shots in the NDC field to pick up nomination forms, and they include Alban Badbin, and the second deputy speaker of parliament and long seven MP for the Nadoli Kaliu constituency. Well, he is not the only one. Well, he's also full speculation that he may be retiring after his current term expires. He's not the only one, as Inu Safuseni, member of parliament for Tamale Central, as well as Fifi Kwete, MP for Ketu South, Richard Kwashiga, MP for Keta, Benis Helu, MP for Hohoi Ani, Lai Afoteado, MP for Tung Katamanso constituency, all failed to pick up nomination forms. Well, while some are exiting, others are making entrance. And actor John Dumelo has picked up forms for the Ayawaso West Wagon constituency. It will be recalled that um, he rescinded his decision in the by election to contest. Also, Superintendent Peter Tugu, he retired uh, he is also going to contest for the Wa West prime in the Wa West constituency for the NDC primary is a former aide of the inspector general of police uh, he's not the only one Felix Ofosu Kwachu wants to stand in the Abrase Bukwamankese constituency Kofi Adams for Buem constituency Nano Yelitha for the Adenta constituency and CD Abubakar youth organizer of the NDC will be standing in the Medina Abukobu constituency in the primaries as well as lawyer Kojoga Adawudu he's going to stand for the Okaikwe Central constituency in the NDC primaries Meanwhile, there are some members of parliament who are also seeking re-election and they, they're seeking to return to parliament after an absence. They include Dr. Hanabisu, David Tete Asumin and Senna Okitidria. So it will be interesting to see how this turns out in the NDC primaries which is scheduled for August this year. 
You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Let's now continue with the rest of our stories. And the family of 35-year-old Kofi Poku have accused the police of assaulting him, leading to his death. And Kofi Poku died under suspicious circumstances Sunday morning on July 7 in the custody of the Tafo police. The family is seeking justice for Kofi Poku, also known as Eshu. Let's now speak to Beatrice Pio Gabra. She is a Shanti Regional Correspondent. And thanks for your time, Beatrice. Beatrice, it's been over a week since this incident happened. What is the Ghana Police Service saying about investigations so far? Hello, Beatrice. Well, we'll try back to get through to Beatrice on this incident. Beatrice, can you hear me? You're watching Midday Live from the News Hub. In the course of the bulletin, you can get interactive with us. Facebook.com slash TV3Ghana, Twitter.com slash TV3Ghana. Let's continue with other news. And a joint team of armed police and an anti galamsey tax force numbering about 50 have stormed the Achim Heman Fantiakwa South District of the Eastern Region due to clashes between some residents and staff of Doming Community Mining, a small-scale mining firm, and residents are protesting mining at the banks of the Birim River, complaining the company is mining within the buffer zone, and the residents blocked the company from transporting an excavator through the community to their mining sites and also attempted to set fire into the hijacked excavator. Let's go back to our earlier story where the family of 35-year-old Kofi Poku have accused the Ghana Police Service of assaulting him leading to his death. And Kofi Poku died under suspicious circumstances Sunday morning on July 7 in the custody of the Tafo Police. And the family is seeking justice for Kofi Poku, also known as Eshko. Let's speak to Beatrice Pio Gabra. She is our Shanti Regional Correspondent. And thanks for your time, Beatrice. Earlier on, I was, I was asking, it's been over a week since this incident happened. What is the Ghana Police Service saying about investigations so far? Okay, good afternoon to you, Portia. What I can say is that last week, an autopsy was conducted on the body of Kofi Poku, and a doctor representing the family and some family elders were there to oversee the autopsy, and also a doctor from that of the police. Now, what we have to say is that the police have sent um, the report to Accra for a forensic audit. So the result of the forensic audit will ascertain the next line of action that the police would have to take. And traditionally, the family should have done a one-week observation that was yesterday, but speaking to family sources, they are saying that until they get the result from the police, they cannot do any family um, gathering to announce a date for the funeral of their relatives or their sons. So until they get the final result from the police, as to know exactly what caused the death of their family member, that is when they can fix a date for the family. But the police are also saying that um, the report, they are waiting the report from their forensic audit in Accra before they can proceed with further investigation. Which is what's the reaction from the family? Well, they are happy that at least they were part of the, the whole autopsy procedure and also a member of the family, one of the brother of Kofi who arrested on the day of the incident has also been granted police bail. So it's back to the South they are happy about it. But mm. their mood cannot be that of a joyous mood until they get the final conclusion to the exact cause of the death of their brother and relative. Thank you very much, Beatrice Pio Gabra, for that update. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. And still in the Ashanti region, residents of Dagomba Line have resolved to maintain peace in the area. And this was after disturbances over a parcel of land last week, which left about seven persons injured. Some has returned at Dagomba Line area after a violent clash that led to the death of two. But as you can see, business has slowed down in the area. Several residents, especially women and children, have also packed out of the area 
for fear that the clash might reignite. The violent clash led to the burning of several houses and properties worth thousands of Ghana cities. Several other persons have also been injured and are receiving treatment at various hospitals within the Kumasi metropolis. Let me engage with some of the residents and find out how they are taking this situation. Now, what do you want the government to do? We know the violent clash um, is not helping. It has led to the death of some of your colleagues. Uh, we just, what we want is peace. We want peace in this community because we've been enjoying peace in this community and we don't, we don't, we, we don't like violence. And we are business partners and, uh, and brothers as well, religiously. So we are not enemies. We are, we are friends all the time. So you can't even identify this guy is Zengo guy or this guy is the Gumba guy. We are all family and uh, we are, we've been enjoying that since day one. And we don't want to miss that peace. We just we want peace. That's what we want. What do you think can be done to bring this peace? Uh, like, then we have to, they have to, the, the security sector have to, to put some measures and to respect some measures because if you don't understand how I feel, I don't and I don't understand how you feel. How how can you bring peace? You know. So and the shooting is like that. Though both parties are not exchanging bullets. It's like the the, the police are. They said that they want to show, want to show, but they are killing people. Yeah. You understand? You understand what I mean? So it's like the police are. People feel like the police are on the other side or and they left the other side behind. So that is it's like it's pain. So what we want is like peace, we need peace. So to, to bring peace in this community, we have to do justice. So we don't have to fight. We are, we are not enemies, we are friends. Say first night, you don't know. Don't go for no, see, me plot, me plot, and I'm going to get this one. And I'm going to be a bubu kiosk, and I'm going to say no, I'm going to be a bubu kiosk. I came before, I'm going to be a bubu kiosk. I'm going to be a bubu kiosk. I'm going to be a government. But now, I'm going to be a bubu kiosk. I'm going to be a bubu as I said, your mom is a bay assassin because of my bay assassins in me, Ghana, and anything I eat this. A bay no ekase will be too much. Momma already said, will be free so I know. Say, I didn't know the NSA, I didn't want a bass over two. Casa Casa Biani Honum now, or because I mean sorry, mean sorry. Bear and you didn't know about it to me, and they are the. And some be brave and they bar my son. The residents here are calling for peace, but for them, they are not ready to leave the area because they believe the land belongs to the government and they are also Ghanaians. This bent house belongs to the other group that were claiming ownership of the land. As you can see, um, they've all evacuated from the house for fear of their safety now the 110 people that were arrested last week were processed to court on friday and all of them have been remanded in police custody to reappear in court on friday july 19th the 15 who were also injured and hospitalized um, so far 12 of them have been treated and discharged the remaining three to, we are told, are in a stable condition. We will keep updating you on any development as we get it in our subsequent bulletin. Ibrahim Abubakar, TV3, Dagombalai Goro. Thank you very much, Ibrahim Abubakar, for that update. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. President Ekufuado has appointed former managing director of the Ghana Maritime Authority, Kwame Wusu, as chairman of the board of directors of the Ghana Revenue Authority. While well, a letter from the office of the president dated June 18, 2019, congratulated Kwame Wusu for his appointment and urged him to indicate acceptance of the new rule within 14 days. And Kwame Wusu reportedly resigned as MD of the Ghana Maritime Authority in February 2019. He was accused of renovating his two-bedroom cantonment residence at the cost of 1 million cities and using over 10,000 cities to host a lunch meeting for 17 people at a hotel he owns. And a probe was subsequently instituted into the matter by government. And joining us on the phone line is anti-corruption crusader Vitus Adim 
Azim for more updates on this development. And good afternoon and thanks for joining us, sir. You're welcome. Would it be strange to say that while the probe which was instituted by government is yet to be made known, Mr. Kwame Wusu has been appointed board chairman of the Ghana Revenue Authority? Sorry, can you repeat? I was asking, would it be strange to, to say that while the probe um, which made the MD, the former managing director of the Ghana Maritime Authority, is yet to be made known, he has been appointed as board chairman of the Ghana Revenue Authority? Well, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not surprising when you look at how uh, things... Hello, Mr. Azim. Yes. Kindly reposition yourself. We can hardly hear you. Yeah, your, your, the line is not, I don't know why. I've come out it, of the it's house, better now. Uh, you go ahead. Okay. So you're asking whether it is strange. Exactly. Yes. It, 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 it's, it's, it's strange because people have expected that when your name has come up and rounds for, the, for, 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 for bad reasons, uh, you cannot immediately be given another appointment after resigning from that institution or retiring from that institution. There were serious allegations of corruption and uh, conflict of interest issues, which were supposed to be investigated or were being investigated. Mm. All of a sudden, we hear that he's being appointed as board, uh, chairman of the board of GRA. Mm. And that is definitely strange. What will be the impact of this development on anti-corruption campaigns in the country? Well, it is a sign that uh, the president or the government is not serious about the fight against corruption. Mm. And so these are things that, if they continue, will, 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 will further lower our score in the CPI this year. Because people will see that nobody is taking the fight against corruption seriously. As an anti-corruption campaigner, would you suggest that he, he revokes this appointment? I think that would have been the best way to go. Because when you look at uh, the, 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 the proposed building of the, 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 parliament, the chamber for parliament, uh, they listened and they decided that they were going to drop the matter. Mm. And even the president was happy that they had listened and decided they were going to drop the matter. So I would be surprised if the president continues, I mean, does not revoke this appointment because he is supposed to be a listening president. He has committed, he has promised Ghanaians. Uh, that is going to fight corruption. And these are some of the things that you would, you, you, you would avoid if you are really fighting corruption. Mm. And so that will be the best step for him to take. Because, for example, if Shrike investigates and comes out with, with damning uh, findings, it will be embarrassing to the government itself. And so one would not expect the mm. president to continue to insist that this person should hold on to that position. Before you go, what more pressure can civil society groups and anti-corruption campaigners like yourself put on government to ensure that details of this probe are made known? You see, this has not taken the, the, the same trend as the one against the chamber. There was a letter, they had already circulated a letter for people to sign about drop that chamber. Now there should be something mm. dropped that Mr. Wusu, but that is not, not happening. Mm. And uh, so that could be one. The other thing is for people to come out and demonstrate. But in Ghana, these things are, uh, often do not happen. So well, you could, there could be a WhatsApp or Facebook or social media campaign against it saying, drop that person. Or even threaten, the set, give a date for people to come out and demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Because you see, we pay our taxes and we, are, we want to be sure that our taxes are being used well. And that the people who are guiding the collection of those taxes are people that have an impeccable uh, sign of in integrity. Mm. And until this man is investigated and found to, to have done nothing wrong, we cannot say that of him. Mm. Thank you very much for your time. And Vitos Azim is an anti-corruption campaigner. Are you still watching Midday Live from the News Hub? Let's now focus on sanitation. And two years ago, the World Health Organization 
United Nations ranked Ghana the seventh dirtiest country in the world. Well, fast forward 2019, the situation has not changed. So we ask, is it behavioral or sociological? In this report, Deborah Jifa Makafui attempts to understand why the problem persists. The capital city, Accra, is overwhelmed with uncollected refuse daily, which poses serious risk to public health. In 2017, the World Health Organization ranked Ghana the seventh dirtiest country in the world. Two years on, not much has changed. And even though the past government have adopted interventions to remedy the situation, it appears waste management remains a bigger challenge. Accra alone generates close to 3,000 tons of waste daily. Wet damp is a major source of worry for waste management companies, as the main dumping sites in Accra are almost full. Much attention, too, is not paid to recycling, which could remedy the situation. Authorities have in the past relied on attitudinal change campaigns as a means of changing the trend, but it appears much has not been achieved. So we ask, is the average Ghanaian concerned how dirty his or her environment is? Ghanaians are not dirty. It is because of the way we have made the Ghanaian. Leadership at all levels, from the district through the regional to the national, they have dirty mindsets. They are not making us, I mean, do what we are supposed to be doing. He implored government to take sanitation seriously. We need leaders to also do a kind of encouraging communities to mobilize resources to be able to do things to uh, save themselves. But a psychologist, Bedou Ajiman, believes the psychological makeup of Ghanaians could have a role to play in all this. We as psychologists believe that experience, exposure, to a particular situation can invariably affect your behavioral patterns. We believe that people learn by watching and emulating the steps of relevant others. He explained certain steps must be taken to consciously psych Ghanaians in the fight against insanitary conditions in the country. What is our orientation? At school, children may not be engaging in this simply because they may have seen their teachers, they may have seen some adults, they may have seen some hawkers, they may have seen some market women littering around. So while in some cultures they groom these toddlers and young ones to appreciate the need to ensure that the environment is clean, we are rather empowering young ones to appreciate that littering is a norm. In Ghana, approximately 13,900 adults and 5,100 children die as a result of poor sanitation and hygiene every year. So do join me, dear general, as we embark on our sanitation campaign at with the hashtag garbage out. Coming up is the MTN video report. And today, Vincent Kofi Sabla report from Oman joined the Greater Accra region on indiscriminate waste disposal. I'm reporting from Omanjo. Government school. This is a school that I'm reporting from. These are the people in the classrooms. This is the whole school. And this is a rubbish dump they have created just at the back of my house. And this is my fence wall. They have defecated. You can see them. They are all here. This is what they have done. And this is my house. This is my bedrooms. And this is my fence wall. And these are the people that have been urinating here. These are some of the students. This is what they have been doing. Over the years, I have complained and complained. Reporting from Omanjo, the government school. Thank you, Vincent, for that update on sanitation. You can also send your video report via WhatsApp on the number 055 143 3044. You're still watching Middle Life on the News Hub. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us.
Hello again, it's now time for business and unionized workers of the Ghana Port and Harvest Authority and Maritime Dock Workers have called off an intended set-down strike today after Director General of the Ghana Port and Harvest Authority gave an assurance of the unionized and maritime dock workers joining in as parties with management of GPHA and Meridian Port Services to review the port's concession agreement and maintain the 100% of work by the authority and retain jobs. Jobs. And this will be the third meeting as parties put to finality to issues raised in a concession agreement and the two-week period promised by President Ekufado has elapsed. Let's speak to our reporter, Josephine Frimpon. She is at the Tema Port and joins us on phone. Thanks for your time, Josephine. So what is going on at the port currently? Are the workers still gathered there? Hello, Josephine. Hello, Josephine. Well, we'll get back to Josephine, where unionized workers of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority and maritime dock workers have called off an intended set down strike. We'll get back to Josephine and give viewers updates in our subsequent bulletins. Let's go to the Ashanti region, where the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly has begun an exercise to allocate shops in the new Kijitia markets to traders. And the allocation exercise is to afford the traders an opportunity to inspect the allocated shops and agree agree to occupy them or otherwise before the final tenancy agreement is issued. A report by Beatrice Piogabra. The allocation is being done for traders who have gone through the required processes of verification, validation and exhibition. An initial 1,350 traders will be given the allocation papers. Kumasi Metropolitan Chief Executive Ose Asibi Entry described the allocation exercise as very necessary for the traders to report of any defects in the shops. The process will also give the traders an opportunity to ask for a different size of shops. We will give them the opportunity to go and have a look at it because we can't allow somebody to pay without looking at it or verifying it. So that is why we have the acceptance in it. We have done with KGTR okay. and we are done with Central Market. But we are working first with the KGTR before we will proceed to the Central Market. After the allocation exercise, the traders will take advantage of the flexible payment schedules and occupy the shops. Traders who went through the validation and verification exercises have been asked to remain patient. The assembly has assured only those who are entitled to the shops will be allocated same. Leaders of the traders who have been waiting for the completion and allocation of shops express gratitude to the assembly. We can see the joyous mood our people are in. It's been almost four years, two weeks now since this journey started. Initially, we were skeptical. Many were doubting that we are not going to get access back to the shop. But thanks be to God, today the first allocation is being done. So we are happy. The traders entreated the assembly to speed up the allocation exercise and handing over of tenancy agreements for them to start business in August. Let's go back to Tema, where unionized workers of the Ghana Port and Harvest Authority and maritime dock workers have called off an intended set-down strike today after Director General of the Ghana Port and Harvest Authority gave an assurance of the unionized and maritime dock workers joining in as parties with management of GPHA and Meridian Port Services to review the port's concession agreement and maintain the 100% of work by the authority and retain jobs. And this will be the third meeting as parties put to finality to issues raised in the concession agreement and the two-week period promised by President Ekufuado has elapsed. Our reporter Josephine Frimpon joins me from the Tema port. And Josephine, what is currently ongoing at the port? Are the workers still gathered there? No, for sure. What we rightly told you was... Um, the intended sit-down strike has been called off and all the workers have resumed to work. So operations are currently going on and it, it's quite exciting for the workers because initially they had planned to stay off and not work. Mm -hmm. But when the GG came in and gave them the assurance, they have moved to work. And then by the close of the day, they will be joining management of GPHA, Meridian Port and Harvest Authorities, 
They have sought their services, have Lodge and Volare Group to sit down and produce the concession mm -hmm. agreement. And what they are putting on the table is that they want to ensure that the 100% containers that they used to handle initially should remain so that their jobs will be clean. If there is any situation whereby the 100% is not retained, then they start a risk for probably losing their jobs and getting these workers off from it. So, push at the course of the day, they will be joining the tripartite meeting to also put in their stake so that they can retain their jobs. Thank you very much, Josephine Frimpong, for your time. You're still watching Midday Live from the News. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. The Ifwa Sutherland Park in Accra played host to the maiden edition of the Wache Festival, where the food, music and fun-packed event was to bring together Wache lovers to help raise funds to support street kids. Wache originally a northern dish is now found in almost every city and town in Ghana. The Wache Festival attracted scores of people who took time to enjoy their favorite local meal. Festival's aims is to promote one of Ghana's most common local foods whilst helping raise funds to support street kids. And we have a responsibility to um, impact lives, so I feel um, we have to impact lives in these kids by feeding them. Then I think bring our local food to a global standard because we love our uh, local food. What's it without we lay? Rice and bean without shit or rice and bean. Eh, without we lay? Rice and bean without shit or rice and bean. Well, a plate of watch after this bulletin won't be bad at all. Well, that's it for Midday Life. Thanks so much for watching. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.